just half of a minute. No, not a problem. Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, hello, boys and girls. <laughs> Again, how how are you? Uh, again, in this uh, new episode of the Volley Talks, in the Plus Volleyball uh, fa Facebook page. My name is Alejandro Castillo. Today is Wednesday, October eighth, October seventh of twenty twenty. Uh, I will. I feel very very honored today because uh, we have here a great volleyball legend, great volleyball personality. Uh, all the way from San Diego, California, Mr. Pat Powers. Hello, Pat. How's everything over there in San Diego? It's good. Um, just starting to settle into fall weather, which means it's about 82. So um, what, what would that be? That'd probably be about 30, 31 centigrade. So. Oh, it's very, very good weather. Yeah, it is. It is nice. Okay. Thanks for being here, Pat. It's, it's, a, it's really an honor. You are... Uh, great volleyball personality since the 80s or, or maybe late 70s uh, winning you you won all you won everything ncaa uh, world cup world championships in both indoor and beach uh olympics and uh, well today uh, you have a you have a job or you have a, a, an assignment in fibb and also uh you have this great project in, uh, in with the clinics in in san diego so uh, I hope we can talk uh, all of that in, in, this, in this time. But again, thanks, thanks a lot for being here, Pat. Thanks for having me, Alejandro. <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, hope, you, uh, hope you can, you can uh, or we can start talking about, about your beginnings. It was volleyball, your first sport, your first choice. Uh, did you start in the, in the, at the club level and then the, in college? How was that beginnings? No, actually, they didn't have club volleyball when uh, most of us were coming up here in uh, the 70s and 80s. I don't think club volleyball hit the United States until the 90s, at least, if not the late 90s. But um, my first sport, believe it or not, was wrestling. I used to wrestle. Oh, really? And I used to wrestle in, it'd be the 50 kilo. 50? 50 kilos, maybe 50, maybe 112 pounds. So it's probably close to maybe a 53 kilos. And I was six feet tall. So that would be about 180 centimeters or something. And I had really long hair. So the joke was I could run around the shower and not get wet. I was really, really thin. So, <laughs> um, and that was my sophomore year in high school. And then you know, we discovered volleyball. We started playing it in high school and we'd play it all the time. We'd, you know, skip classes and play. We'd play on the beach. We did, you know, um, we, we just played a lot of volleyball. And I was actually one of the uh, players that uh, was in a very select group of players. And, you know, myself and Dusty Dvorak, we sat down and figured this out one time that if you went between Santa Barbara and Laguna Beach, as far as location, and as old as St. John Smith and as young as Randy Stoklos. So those two parameters, you'd have myself, Karch, Dusty, Craig Buck, Steve Sammons, Tim Hovland, Mike Dodd, um, uh, Steve Timmons, um, all these great players, John Hanley, all these, John Stevenson, all these great players that really in Southern California um, half of us stayed and played indoors, and the other half went out on the beach and uh, founded the AVP Tour. So it was a very special time for us. Mike Dodd was another one. And uh, it was just a, a great time to play volleyball and, and uh, just, you know, just, just a great time for us. So I uh, just started just for fun to play in volleyball. You never imagined to become pro or go to the World Championship? No, I mean, that was never on our minds. Um, you know, back then it was, there was maybe in the eighties, there were like maybe, you know, 20 pretty good volleyball players and no club volleyball. Um, most of us were from the West coast and, you know, we had, we had several players that were really good. Uh, Mark Waldy, Rich Julius, all the Spursons from the uh, East coast and among others. I mean, there were some really good players back then. And um, so we were, we were very blessed with that. And, you know, and we, things just happened. You know, we 
we have the year round training center and a lot of us fought it. And at first we were back in Dayton, Ohio, and then we ended up in, in San Diego under the, under the uh, leadership of Doug Beal and Bill Neville. And, uh, you know, we were lucky that we started something and we trained year round, um, you know, January through December. And uh, we played a lot of matches and, um, you know, by 1984, we were a pretty good team. Yes, I remember that. I, I, I uh, by '84, I, I didn't know about volleyball. I, I had never heard of volleyball here in Mexico. But I remember perfectly '84 uh, uh, Olympics with that great team, including you, Karch, and uh, Kurt Bock, uh, etc. Rich Lightis, and I fell in love with volleyball at that time because it was a pretty amazing sport played by pretty amazing athletes. And see, I, I'm a follower of volleyball since then. Uh, I'm, I have never been a great volleyball player, but I'm a great volleyball fan. So, uh, yeah, I, I started to, to, to follow you or this team since, since then. Uh, and, and Tan, please uh, tell us something. How did uh, beach volleyball uh, improve your indoor volleyball skills? How, how important is to is to for young players uh, to combine both beach and, and indoor? You know, back when we played, we would play both. Um, you know, Karch was obviously the best at it. He won a gold medal both in indoors and you know, in the Atlanta Olympics. Um, but, you know, myself and Karch and, you know, Mike Dodd and some, some of the other players, I mean, we played both all the time. And, um, you know, it wasn't that big. But, it, I mean, there are certain things it does and there are certain things it does not do. One is it just mentally prepares you to, to grind out and side out and, you know, just play. And uh, so there's a mental aspect, which I think is really good for you. But the thing about beach volleyball that's, that I try to impress upon the kids today is whatever you don't do well, you're going to do often. Okay. So Alejandro, if you don't set well, they're going to serve me every ball. Okay. If you don't pass well, they're going to serve you every ball until you pass better, until you set better. So Really, that, that's what the beach game is all about, is whatever you don't do well, you're going to do often, and that's how you get better in sports. Yes, yes, of course. And well, in current days, uh, it is hard to find a player who plays both indoor and, and beach, right? <laughs> it has become a more specialized to the sports. Yeah, I know that you don't see that crossover anymore. You know, Phil, Dow Phil Dowhauser would have been a phenomenal indoor player. But as it turns out, he's been one of the most dominant uh, outdoor players that we've ever seen. Um, you know, and it's too bad because, you know, sometimes it, it'd be great if, we, if they could combine them, if you could have both if players playing both. But in today's world, I think, I think they'd be overloaded. You know, I think there's uh, one of the main concerns of the national teams, one of the main concerns of the FIVB, one of the main concerns of the athletes and the agents themselves is you don't want to overstress and overwork the players. Um, they need a break. I mean, they should be taking, you know, one to two months off a year um, because if you don't, your body's going to break down you're going to grind down. And so there's that fine balance of, you know, getting better, staying healthy, but yet competing for a, a, a Olympic title or, you know, a world cup or world championship title. So, you know, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, and well, also I can remember recently uh, two players, Reed Pretty and Paul Lotman, and they, they, they played uh, very well indoor, but it was hard uh, uh, even for them to play uh, pro beach volleyball, right? It, it, it's yeah, hard. Beach volleyball is all about setting. Um, it, and it takes you, it takes an Olympic indoor player. If they came out and they started to play on the beach, it would probably take them you know, maybe a year back when we played, it would probably be a year and a half before they could really uh, get good, dominate and everything. I mean, but it's all about setting and it's all about, there's just small nuances of the game that it just takes a long time to learn. Yeah, right. I totally agree, uh, Pat. And uh, regarding about um, all the old school beach volleyball, uh, you know, uh, in early 80s or mid 80s, versus uh, today, beach volleyball, which are the, the main differences, uh, despite ob obviously the marketing and uh, all, all that? Well, I, well, obviously the main difference is the size of the court. Um, and 
I, I really think the level of athlete right now is much higher than when we played. Um, I was somewhat of an anomaly at uh, 198 centimeters playing. And today's players, you know, are 205, 210, 210 centimeters. They're just not, but not only are they tall, but they're extremely athletic. Um, you know, back when we played, if you had a guy that was, um, you know, 205 or 210 centimeters, uh, they, they just weren't very coordinated. They were limited, but not today's players. I mean, these guys are incredibly athlete. They're so strong. They're so fast. Uh, they're so powerful that, um, that that's really the biggest difference I think is the level of athlete that is playing the game in both indoors and outdoors. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, well, please go back a little Pat, to your call to your college, uh, career. You played in which college? University USC, of Southern right? California, USC. You are Trojan. <laughs> <laughs> please tell, uh, please tell us a little about about that that time. Uh, you and your team won uh, once or or twice the national championship. Yeah, we played in the finals in 1979, and we won in 1980. And um, um, in '79, we might have won, but. Uh, Uh, Dusty Dvorak sprained his ankle and it kind of changed the tenor of the game. So, but, you know, we split with the Bruins and the funny part was is um, half the Bruins and half the Trojans were actually a good portion of the, you know, the Olympic team in 1984 and 85 yes. and 86. So, um, you know, we're all good friends. We played against each other, but it was really competitive, you know, so uh, great matches. And uh, well, obviously, the especially men's volleyball in recent years has developed a, a lot uh, comparing to that uh, 1980 championship, right? How, how much did you did you think? Or how much do you think uh, volleyball has been grown, and how much room to grow uh, have especially men's volleyball? No, well, I think men's volleyball can grow in the United States uh, at the collegiate level. Um, as you know, we don't have. Uh, a professional league or club volleyball here in the United States, which we've tried to start multiple times. We've had some interest um, for whatever reason, it hasn't really uh, been successful. It doesn't mean it's not going to be successful. I think uh, the, the market is there. Um, you know, we just have to figure out how to market it. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing. And, and one of the things that has not been good for us is we've had COVID hit And we've lost some programs collegiately. The, the like Stanford, right? Stanford. And uh, that's devastating uh, because um, some of the, you know, some of our great volleyball players, uh, Scott Fortune, uh, John Root. I mean, they all came from Stanford and, you know, uh, Mike Lambert. I mean, these are great players. And, the Chojis. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they're really good players. So that has set us back and and i just got into this discussion this morning with somebody um you know is men volley, vo volleyball going to be around in five years or 10 years and i think it will uh but um i, I think we just have to get past this COVID and uh, see how we turn out on the other end yeah right because uh well in europe uh men's volleyball is is, uh, is huge right it's uh, they have uh, very big professional leagues, especially in Italy, in Poland. A lot of American players go overseas to play there. And I, I can assume that they, they will love to play in the United States versus Europe. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I love Europe. Um, I played two years in Italy and uh, uh, two years in France and one in uh, Croatia. So I love my time over there. I do a lot of reading and, uh, you know, learn the language and, you know, meet great people and everything. But um, You know, it's something that we have to get is, you know, a pro league. And I think it might be more successful with the women. Um, in the United States right now, by far and away, the most marketable side we have of volleyball outside of the Olympics would be the women's collegiate final four. Um, and I've watched it every year for 20 years. And I'm telling you, these girls are phenomenal. Especially, uh -huh. especially if, you, if you do it in Nebraska. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't matter. You can do it in Nebraska. You can do it in California. You can do it in Florida. You can do it anywhere. Um, but the, the quality of play in the NCAA Women's Final Four is it's probably the best volleyball I see. Um, I mean, it's just so good. You know, the girls are so athletic and they're, and they're, 
the rallies are great, um, long rallies, uh, great personalities, extremely well produced on the television end. So um, that's something that we need, really need to do and get going for the men. Okay. And well, the, the Women's uh, Pro League, uh, I think it's, it's scheduled to start in February, right, in Nashville? It is, um, you know, and I hope it, you know, we all hope it succeeds. Um, you know, I think my, my personal thought is instead of going out and trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, what we should do is just um, decide that maybe we should expand our clubs. So now, you have, and, and this would be the European model um, in which we have small clubs. Gus, come here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you my dog here. Hold on. <laughs> Gus, come on. Come on. Come on. Gus, come on. Gus, come on. Hold on, hold on. Come here. There, there, there we are. <laughs> um, <laughs> gotta, gotta get, he, he, he needs to have showtime. But, uh, I know. Uh, you know, it, it'd be great if we can, um, if we can expand on that. So I think Women's Pro League would be absolutely great. Yes, of course. And well, um, in this, uh, during this pandemic, AVP, uh, they had uh, this tournament in Long Beach, uh, I think two or two and a half months ago, uh, because, well, uh, players, they, they, they desired to play. I think, also think it was uh, gr uh, good for TV, TV audience, right? Yeah, do they have an audience or no? Um, I didn't watch it personally, um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think the fans and, you know, when we came up and played, um, you needed three things in order to have a great beach tournament, a beach, prize money, and beer. And if you had those three things, you, you didn't have to have a lot of prize money, but if you had the fans and beer and just, you know, and it made for a great tournament. And because I think what volleyball needs to do is they need to go away from being a sport uh, to being an event. And that's what you want to be. You want to be an event. And I think that's um, really where we needed to go. Yeah, yeah, to totally, totally agree with you. Uh, but well, I have uh, some uh, messages for sure. you. Al Alfredo Cabero from Chile says, uh, kind regards from Chile, the best of for both Pat and Alex. Thanks, Alfredo. Thanks. Very, very, very huge fan of volleyball in, in Chile. Here I have another friend, a friend from Mexico, Juan Alberto Negrete says, greetings, Alex and Pat. Pat, I met you in Long Beach and I saw you play at the Los Angeles 84 Olympia, Olympics and it was something out of the ordinary, unforgettable and a unique experience. You are for me the best player in that tournament and a fixture, uh, uh, I send you a hug. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Please, Pat, uh, go with this, uh, with this uh, amazing team. How, which factors uh, this converge to assemble this great team in that time, uh, a time in 84 when the United States uh, hosted the Olympics. And it was an extraordinary team that they, well, they you have as a team, a lot of uh, successes like 84 Olympics, 88, 85 World Cup, 86 World Championship. Uh, which factors did converge for this? What do you think? Um, you know, I think it was the way we trained. Um... You know, we were so intense in training. And, and I try to explain this to people, but when we trained uh, at eight o'clock in the morning, we could get in and play uh, at the highest level at eight o'clock in the morning when it did not mean anything. Um, and when you start to train at that level, if you watch your injuries and you don't get injured too much, um, you're going to get a lot of good work out of it. And what happened was, I think by 1985 or thereabouts, um, we kind of developed a training personality and an off-court personality. And on the court, we were about as mean and about as fierce as you could ever imagine. Uh, if you made a mistake, you were going to hear about it. If you didn't run sprints, you were going to hear about it, not from the coach, but the team itself. And I think that was really important because um, it allowed us to train at such a high level that when we played in, uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we could play at the same level as we did during the Olympics. Um, and there wasn't any pressure on us. I mean, we, you know, it was much easier to play. We were, we never felt stressed. Um, we didn't make mistakes. I mean, you can beat us. You know, the Brazilian team back then uh, with Bernard and De Silva and Reina, and they're all just great players. And uh, 
They could beat us. They had, they had a tremendous amount of talent. The Russians could beat us. Um, but we just happened to play well at the right time, I think, for, you know, about four years there. Um, from 1984 to, to 1988, I think we were a pretty good team. You know, um, I wasn't there in the 88 Olympics. So I had already gone over to Europe, but, um, you know, we're still a formidable team. Yes, right. Um, at that time, uh, Pat, or, or before, which, um, which, per, which people do you think uh, were your, your influences for you, your, your role models uh, at that time where you were in college and in the national team? Yeah, I mean, you know, the role models were some of the old beach players and, and uh, you know, Ron Von Hagen and, you know, Ron Lang. I mean, these guys are, you know, years and years ago. Um, you know, on the beach, they were our role models. And, you know, we just kind of had to really develop our own. Though. I mean, we didn't really look up to anybody. I think it was more of a question of what we were going to do each day in practice and how we were going to get better and uh, how we could push each other and, you know, Um, and I think that really helped us. And I think soon thereafter, after we won the 84 Olympics, I think France was the next country to start training year round as a team. And they're really good with Philip Long and, you know, uh, the whole, I mean, they were, they were just a rock solid team. And uh, you run up into every, these teams every once in a while, uh, Serbia, um, Yugoslavia, when they were, when they won the gold medal um, with Gervich and those guys, I mean, Um, guys weren't big, they weren't huge. Uh, they were, you know, just very good players, but mentally, technically, they were, they were so tough. Um, you couldn't beat them. Um, or let me put it this way is the mark of a good team is they don't beat themselves. You know, you're not, you know, you can beat them, but they're not going to give you points. And we never gave points away. You'd have to earn them. Yeah. Well, Afro Cabero, my man from Chile says, What a fantastic era, USA team. Uh, which he said he, he asked that which uh, team was the hardest to play against and beat, and she men uh, he mentions Russia, Brazil, Argentina, etc. No, they were all tough. Um, you know, Cuba, the one team you didn't mention, they were they were a phenomenal team. Yes, right. Cuba was good. Uh, France was good. Russia, without question, was you know the dominant the dominant team. Um, but I think the advantage we had during that period was we always trained together. And I think the the disadvantage that these other teams had was in the winter, they would all go and they would go play club volleyball for their club teams. And they'd come back and they'd play together for maybe uh, three weeks or a month and they'd train and, you know, and everything. And, and individually they were good, but we had the advantage of just, just being a better team. And I think that's why I went Brazil, you know, without question, um, one of the toughest teams ever, you know, um, if we played them, we would lose half the matches uh, almost all the time. Uh, they just have some phenomenal talent, you know, just, and I mean, in today, both the men's and women's teams of Brazil are just, um, they're so physical, so good. Um, and I, they're really fun to watch. So it's, they're really a great compliment to the sport. Okay, uh, Pat, um, um, uh, clear me something. It was in the in the in the early '80s. Are you uh, allowed to play overseas in pro, in pro clubs in Europe? No, we were not. Um, we had to play. We had to train here all the time, and and um, and that was true from oh god, 1979 up until. Uh, probably 1988, uh, maybe even beyond, um, the players had to stay and train and play with the national team. And that's what kept me off the Olympic team in 1988 is I decided to go, you know, play beach volleyball or play uh, volleyball for Cus Carino in, uh, in, in Italy and uh, had a great time, loved it for two seasons. Uh, but when I came back and I talked to You know, Marv Dunphy and Doug Beale, um, their policy at the time was is not to allow players back in. So, uh, you know, it's fine. I knew that going away, and uh, so it's not something I regret. Yes, of course, but it, it, was, it, was, it was tough for you. And I think uh, for that, the 84 gold, it was uh, pretty much valuable, valu valuable, right? Because you have no chance at that time to play overseas uh, pro. Yeah, no, we didn't. Um, at least I didn't. Uh, Tim Hoblin did. 
Um, I think he was in Torino and some other players too. Uh, Mike Dodd played over there. I think Jay Anderson played in Switzerland. Some, some of the players did go over and play, but uh, to come back and play the national team, they weren't allowed to do it. No. Uh, well, uh, last question about the 84 Olympics. Um, did, you, did the team uh, feel extra pressure for being playing in U.S. soil in Long Beach? Uh, not really. You know, I, in, I, I'll tell you a funny story about the Olympics, and, and this is something that I, I've talked to other players about, and nobody remembers it, but um, this is something that you've never heard before. And the day of the Olympics, we're, we're going to play Brazil. And at 10 o'clock, we went and did our hour training session at uh, uh, Los Angeles Technical College in a gym over there. And we were so bad, okay? Karch could not pass a free ball. Paul Sunderland could not serve a ball over the net. Dusty Dvorak could not set a ball outside. And I hit three straight balls into the tape. And this is seven hours before we're going to play uh, for a gold medal match. Oh, really? um, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember this so vividly, and I called up Dusty Dvorak to see if he remembered that, and he didn't. But um, Doug Beal called practice early. We had 20 minutes to go, and he stopped practice because we were so bad. And I, I walked out of the gym, and I thought for sure we were going to win the silver medal. There's just no way we're going to win the gold medal. Just no way. In my mind, if you would have saw that practice, We looked like 12 year old girls at best. And, uh, and then we just happened to play well that night. And, uh, you know, we played, we played well against Brazil, a great Brazilian team. And uh, which uh, did you think was the, the, the key factor for, for, the, for that team that night? What, what, what was the key factor? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think part of it was, is I played well, um, all this person blocked well. If you, if you watch the video, if you watch the match over again, which I've done only twice, believe it or not, I've only seen it two or three times. Uh, the player that played the best that, that night for the United States was Craig Buck. Um, he hit extremely well. He blocked a lot of balls. He soft blocked a lot of balls. Uh, he was, you know, um, in watching the match over again, he played probably the best. Um, I hit well outside. Burzins, you know, put a couple, Karch put a couple balls away. And, but also Brazil um, in the semifinal match against us, when they beat us, um, they, they played really well. They served really well. They just jump served us off the court. And all of a sudden we had to block, try, that's back when you could block serves and, and to do all sorts of stuff. And that night they did not serve nearly as well As, uh, as they did in the semifinals. So um, Craig Buck, uh, me hitting a couple balls on the outside and Brazil not serving as well, I think was kind of the determining factor. Right, I, I will see, I will watch the video again <laughs> to, to see this. Watch uh, Craig. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Pat, um, and what happened the next uh, two years? In 85, 86, uh, USA Volleyball won the World Cup in Japan and in 86, the World Championship in Paris. It was, a, it was a very strong generation of players, right? It hasn't been done since. Um, players have won, uh, countries have won the World Championship, the World Cup, and the Olympics, but nobody's won it three straight, straight three years. The triple crown. I, I think Brazil and Russia would probably be the, my two favorites to be able to do it. Um, I think Brazil is just really a good team, but um, uh, nobody's done it since. You know, maybe Poland, who knows? But, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the Olympics next year. I think um, I was over at the Men's World Championships over in Italy. And you got uh, in Bulgaria. I was in Bulgaria and I got to see most of the teams play. And, um, you know, I think people are going to be really excited uh, by what they see in 2021 here at the Olympics. And I think, Pat, uh, next year, Would be great for volleyball because you know usually in the in the world league or now the nations league, uh, all the teams uh, they have uh, not always send their A team, but I think next year will be the the, the greatest uh, VNL of all time because I think all all uh, teams wanna train together, wanna play together with the same uh, roster. They will uh, play in Olympics. Yeah, they will. Um, I'm sure that the national teams are thinking about that right now. And 
again, it's something they have to coordinate with the club volleyball players over in Europe or over in Asia, and they have to give them rest. Um, and But like you say, you want to train and, and uh, win both of the NL and the Olympics. I think those are two major events for the FIBB, obviously the Olympics. Yes, of course. And um, what do you think about uh, today's uh, schedule? I mean, uh, with the with the pro season and the national team season, um, could the, and, and the long 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 travels, long flights for VNL. How much do you think this impacts the mental and physical, um, mentally and physically for players? You know, I haven't done it, so I really couldn't ask, answer it. But um, I know when you fly, it takes something out of you. Um, you know, it takes you a couple of days. You got to get back to your sleep patterns and. It might be easier when you're younger, unlike me, but um, I think it's definitely tougher, but it's tough for everybody. And I think the FIDB realizes that. That's why they've tried to bring in teams and to reduce the travel and uh, you know have the quality of matches at the same time. And I think that's a very smart move uh, by the VNL and, and the FIDB, and I, and I applaud them for that. So, um, but I think it's tough, you know, again, it's, it's You have to watch your body. You have to, uh, you know, bring up some of the younger players. But um, I think there's a lot of factors that go into this. Yeah, right. Uh, well, uh, you told us that uh, after uh, 86, you uh, you left the indoor national team to play beach, or uh, how how was that uh, transition? No, I, I went over and I played in Italy. I played in Torino for two seasons, and uh, but I also played on the beach as well. And uh, I think we, we played in like the first world championship down in Rio de Janeiro in 1986. Might have been actually January of 1987, myself and Karch, we won it. And, uh, you know, we went back the following year. We had a great time. And, and uh, you know, so we've, we've traveled quite a bit. But, um, you know, I, I split my time between Europe and uh, the beach. And consequently, in 1988, I tore my rotator cuff probably from overuse. So... It's just, you know, I, I think the doctors are much better now. I think the, the trainers, uh, everybody has much better idea of, you know, the physical limits your body uh, is, is put on your body. So I think they do a better job at that. Yeah, right. Uh, well, uh, in, in which uh, year did you stop to, to play uh, indoor and, uh, or beach? What, what, when did I stop playing? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I stopped playing indoors, um, you know, professionally in like maybe 1992 or I was over in uh, um, uh, 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 Croatia, which is Yugoslavia at the time. So I was in Zagreb and that was the last I played internationally. And then I played a couple more years on the beach and then I started coaching at USC. So, um, but I, I spent too much time on the beach. I think I was like 36 years old. That's, that's old for a volleyball player. At that time, because uh, right now, uh, Jose, you know, um, uh, this guy from Brazil is still very, Ricardo Santos is still, is still playing at 43 or 44, I think. Well, I'll tell you, he's probably got a great diet and uh, great, you know, and, and again, I think the science of sports has advanced in the last 20 or 30 years to enable players to do that. So I think that's, I think that's great. Yes, of course. Uh, well, uh, once you retired, uh, What did you do first? Uh, um, start your your clinics, your school in, in San Diego, and also uh, did you start to work together with FIBB? Uh, how was that that transition when you ended up playing? Um, when I was done playing, I played on the beach for a couple more years, and then I coached USC for six years. I was up in Los Angeles. I was a head men's coach, and after that. Um, You know, you learn something in volleyball, and that is there's more money in bad volleyball than good volleyball. <laughs> so yeah. everybody wants to coach good players, you know, good college teams, good national teams. Are, no, <laughs> not if you want to make money. If you want to make money, you want to coach bad volleyball players <laughs> for a simple reason is there's more of them. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, so I just started doing volleyball camps and, Uh, I evolved that. I was actually one of the first players to start doing it, and I've been doing it for the last 24 years, and I get to travel this weekend. I'm going up to Tacoma, Washington to do a camp, so 
you know, this October has been very busy and it's COVID has hit me pretty hard this, uh, uh, during the summer. I mean, we had to cancel a lot of camps and everything. So uh, we're still doing them. Yeah. So, uh, I, ha I have read that, uh, your camps are very successful, right? They are They're You know, I get between, I don't know, 40 and, you know, 75 participants at each camp and, um, I've been doing these for a long time, so I kind of know how to figure figure out how to teach them in a very short period of time, and uh, it's just something I enjoy. Plus, I get to meet so many great people, so it's something I really enjoy. Okay, but, uh, well, I, I thought that, uh, I was thinking that you only develop these camps in San Diego, but no, you go all the nation. Whole nation. Um, New York, Florida, um, Seattle, uh, here, I mean, all over, so... For 24 years <laughs> and uh, please tell us something about these camps uh, anybody can go uh, they can go to to subscribe to the website yeah I mean it's well volleyballcamps.com if you want to go but um, you know mostly I teach young girls um, and adults adults are the best um, adults and you know players in general I mean it I teach them a little bit indoors and a lot of the beach and uh, so both and I And I, right now I have a very small club team here in San Diego. I think usually we get like 50 players. And um, so, you know, I have that and I, and I do that quite a bit as well. So it takes up quite a bit of my time. And uh, you have all your, your own facility in San Diego? No, and I wish I did. <laughs> Because right now I'm at the YMCA. I'm at a local gymnasium. And right now it's closed. So we can't train them. And it's uh, somewhat frustrating. Okay. Um, would you be interested to do some volleyball camps in Mexico or in the near future? Yeah, sure. You can have me down there. <laughs> you yes, know, of course. We, have, we actually have um, a volleyball club in Tijuana that plays in our, uh, in our league here. Yeah. And we have some really good players, uh, really good talent, and, and uh, they drive up to Orange County, and uh, we love having them. I think it's really good for the sport. Um, and I'd like to see more club teams come from, you know, Mexicali or Tijuana or Ensenada. Um, personally, I spend a lot of time in Mexico. I go down to Baja, <laughs> and I spearfish. I don't fish. I, I go on with a harpoon. I spearfish. All oh, right. And, uh, so I go down to uh, Bahia de los Angeles and on the Bajas and uh, spend a lot of time there. So I love I love Baja. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm aware that a lot of uh, teams in Tijuana and Mexicali goes to play in, in different leagues in, in, Cali, in Southern California, and that's great for the development of, 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 of the teams, of Mexican teams, and also for the league, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Adrián Delgado, do you know Adrián Delgado? No, no, well, not. Adrián Delgado works in, or he works in California, in Orange County. He, is, uh, he was the second assistant coach for the Mexican Olympic team that went to Rio four years ago. Oh, wow. And he lives in California. I'm sure, I'm sure we've, uh, I, we passed each other in the, in the gym. Oh, yeah. I spend a lot of time up there as I'm sure he does. Okay. Well, uh, this is a question I made, I made, uh, by the end of the interview, but this is the time, um, uh, Pat, which real Mexican food did you enjoy the most? Uh, that's easy. Uh, chili rellenos. Chili rellenos. Love them. Um, that and taquitos. Um, the chili relleno, though, that's that's where I can tell where the good Mexican food is. And in living in San Diego, um, we have some of the best Mexican food in the world. I mean, it's so good. Um, and that is the one thing when I go travel, um, especially in Europe. If you go to Europe, you can't get good Mexican food. I'm sorry, um, but. We have taco stands here all over the place. And, you know, we stop in and we get burritos and chili rellenos and enchiladas and, you know, fish tacos. And so we have it all, but uh, chili rellenos is the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, have you ever tried a uh, chili relleno taco? It's great. <laughs> no, I've had a chili relleno burrito though. So, um, no, I love chili rellenos. Great. Well, as Randy Gallo says that he he's a club director for Baja Club. Right. Yeah, well, maybe you, you have known him. 
No, I mean, there's, there's so many clubs in this area. Um, there's like literally over a hundred. I know. You know, and just San Diego alone has like 20 and, um, you know, so I'm sure we're, I don't even know the other club directors here. So. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, but um, at the time you were, you were a player, which players of other countries or other clubs uh, did you enjoy the most to play? Uh, it was a it was a challenge to play against them. Cubans, Brazilians, Russians. We were friends with everybody. Um, you know, the Brazilians, they'd come up here and they'd spend a week after we'd play. And, you know, we'd play on the beach and everything. We'd go down there and I stayed at Bernard's house, uh, went to, you know, Rio and Copacabana Beach. And, um, oh, God, I mean, you know, they were great. The, the Russians even though we couldn't understand each other. Now I can speak Italian to um, a couple of them. You know, they speak Italian, so I guess we could converse in Italian. Uh, the Canadians obviously were great friends, the French, I mean, everybody, the Cubans, we got along with everybody. Argentinians, um, you know, they're just some great players from all over the world, um, so. But, but which player with, with, with a name, uh, did you enjoy the most to play against him, or it was a challenge? You you played you played in the in the left side, right? Yeah. So uh, which which uh, which uh, which block was the uh, most difficult for you, or yeah. receiving serve? I think Alexander Savin um, playing at the net. He was probably the best blocker we ever faced. He was just he was a very big, strong guy, you know, and and a great person too. Um, the Brazilians, uh, Shondo, um, Bernard, Renan, they just, you know, their arms are so quick and powerful. Um, they were great. And then, you know, we'd go over to Japan and Japan always had like the guy. Okay. And he was like the guy and he had the haircut going back and he was playing really well. And then you go back six months later and he was no longer the guy. Now they had a new guy and he had his hair back and he, all the girls loved him and everything and cheered for him. So that, that was really fun. So, um, but um, I don't know. I mean, they were, they were all good. We, we had great relationships with all the players off the court, not on the court, but off the court. <laughs> great. Um, um, Pat, uh, which do you think are, are the, the main difference between the, the American volleyball school versus European school or Asian school? Um, back then or now? Uh, I don't know. You choose. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know if there is a difference because if it was back when I was playing, um, I think the, the Asian teams, they ran a much faster offense. Um, you know, they didn't block very well, but they had a very fast offense. The Europeans blocked well, uh, but they didn't, you know, they didn't play great defense and they could side out pretty well. Whereas the Brazilians, uh, they seem to put it all together. The Cubans, same thing. Um, so the American style, I think, was one of consistency. Um, I think we we're just more consistent back then. Um, now all the teams look, look the same. You know, they run the same fast set to the outside, same fast set to the back. They run the pipe. Um, they don't set the middle very much. Everybody jump serves. Uh, they all swing block. They all, they all look pretty much alike. Um, so there's really not a lot of difference that I can see on the court. Now, the way they train might be completely different, but I don't have access to that. Okay. And um, this, uh, this relatively new position, the Libero, how, how much do you think the Libero came to change the, the offensive schemes of the, of the teams? Well, obviously, they, they increased the passing to a certain degree, and, and you can argue that might have been good or bad for the sport. Um, it's very good for the sport in that um, right now, the United States Volleyball Association, we have our own rules separate from the FIVB. So we can substitute 12 players, okay? so not just six, and we can sub them in multiple times. Um, we also have the libero. Well, teams went from like eight to nine players up to 11 to 12 or 13 players on a team. So if you show me two rule changes that can increase your bottom line by 
I'm going to show you two really good rule changes. Okay. Um, internationally, I think it's, um, you know, the, the offense is so stable. I mean, I think, a, you know, the good volleyball teams side out at about 75% of the time. And, you know, the question is, is that good for the sport? Um, personally, I think anything that gives the defense an advantage is better for the sport. So at the FIVB, we're looking at ways to, you know, we're always looking at ways to think of how to make the defense better. Um, and, you know, but it's, you know, like I say, I mean, when I played, and I'm going to have to say this in inches, um, when I played, I could touch 11 feet, four, five inches. That was the highest I ever touched, 11 feet, five inches. So I don't know what that is in centimeters, but today's players are touching 12 feet or 12 feet in four inches. So they're that much higher. Um, they literally are that much more physical in today's game versus when I played. So when you look at that, I think it's really, you have to really look at the rules and the way it's going to impact um, the overall teams, the overall game, the ability to market it and everything else like that. So I think that's all important. Yeah. And Pat, uh, if, he, if it were up to you, uh, which rule uh, did you change in FIVB for global volleyball? Which rule or which rules? Well, that's tough. Um, you know, I, 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 you know it, it's kind of a trick question. And the reason why is when you have good teams play like Brazil and Poland right now in Italy, uh, United States, Um, they don't make a lot of serving mistakes when they're playing well, okay? Um, but when teams are playing bad or you see some teams that are, you know, ranked 20 or 30 or 40th in the world, um, what I think really hurts a game is the number of missed serves. And, uh, you know, there, we have to figure out some way in order to eliminate missed serves um, because I think that's one of the things a women's game does so well is they keep the ball in play more. And at the FIVB, we have an expression in the saying is keep the ball flying. And that's something that every rule that we look at, um, the first question we ask is, does this keep the ball flying? Is this good for the game of volleyball? Is this good for the teams? Is this good for the market, marketability of the sport? And I think that's all important. All right, so, great. So I, I think, that, sorry, I didn't mean to not answer. I think it's something to do with miss, miss serves would be my answer to that. All right, perfect. Well, the, the, the net touch, uh, well, allowing the net touch in the serve, I think it uh, it helped a lot, right? It, yeah, it has. Um, that's helped a little bit. Um, you know, um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens here in the next. We you know we like to we like to experiment. Um, we like to test rules and see how they see how it impacts the game. And I think we'll see that once we can get back in the gym. And have these tournaments and uh, see if you know we can get past this COVID experience. Yeah, right. And well, Pat, uh, we we are uh, next to the we are close to the to the hour. So I want to ask you about your current activities in FIBB. I know that you are a member of FIBB Rules of the Game and Refereeing Commission, and it, it's uh, it's a lot of that uh, that you explained uh, before. Um, you are acting there as a member and uh, measuring new rules and testing new rules. Uh, what, uh, what more in this, uh, in this role? You know, we, we have a really good rules commission. Uh, Willie Paredes is the president of it. Um, Sandy Steele has been, you know, so instrumental for so many years, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. He's been on the rules commission, extremely, extremely bright. We, we have a bunch of great members in there. And um, not only do we look at the rules, but now what we do is we go out and we rate the referees. We, uh, we look at ways that we can help them. Um, and that's extremely important because right now we're starting to bring up some new referees and some very talented referees. And, you know, the United States, we, we have two of the best, you know, Patty Rolfe and Ron Stahl. And uh, both of them are, you know, looking at uh, retiring here from the FIB, FIVB, which is unfortunate because uh, they're two, two great refs. And so part of our um, experience is not only the rules of the game, not only testing, uh, but now what we do is we, we help out the referees and uh, make them better referees. And, and our goal is to not have um, any bad experiences with them. And 
I think the one thing that's really changed since I played um, is, and, and I'm not only playing for, for the Team USA, but also over in Europe, is there were a lot of times we'd be playing and the referees were very biased, okay? They'd make terrible calls for the visiting team. And this is very, very, um, very widespread in uh, volleyball, um, basketball, uh, football, soccer. Um, so you have very bad referee decisions, but at the FIVB, we don't have that. Uh, these referees are so good, they have so much integrity um, that they make, they might miss one call every four sets. Um, and if you think about that, that is, that is an amazing feat and they're all that good. Um, so part of our, part of our duty is to help them get better and, and uh, make sure that we have enough good referees and uh, for the, for the Olympics and all these other world championships. Yes, of course. Right. And um, Pat, almost, almost to, to end this amazing talk with you, um, we, what do you think uh, is coming for volleyball in the next future? Uh, I mean, in terms of development, in terms of, uh, of the physical, of the, of the players, uh, what do you think uh, can we expect in the next few years? You know, I, I mean, I think what's going to happen is, you know, some of the players in, in USA, they're going to retire. And I think you'll see this all over with the many teams, not only the United States, but Brazil and, and Russia and Italy and Poland and all these great teams and great players. And um, so when that happens, um, you can actually see uh, other countries come up. Um, you know, I think Spain was extremely good for a couple of years. Um, and they've kind of dropped down. You might see them come up. You might see... Slovenia you know, is doing a great job, Slovenia. Yeah, I mean, and you might see that. I mean, you might see Bulgaria come up. You might see these Germany. teams come up and, and just, uh, you know, be great. And I think that's one of the things you'll see is I think Brazil will always be good. They're going to be not good, but great. I think Russia's always going to be good. I think we'll be in the top seven, top five, top three. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to see some players age out here. And I think we're going to see some other countries come up. Um, like the Dominican Republic with the women's team. Uh, you know, they've had great success down there. Uh, Chile, uh, the Chilean um, women's team was fantastic years ago. Peru, same thing. Um, they've had some fantastic teams over the years. And I think both for men and women, you'll see a changing of the guard. And uh, I know for the, for the women's team, um, the United States has tremendous talent pool. Uh, we have 900 colleges that play volleyball. And uh, so we have a lot of players that play volleyball, and I think that's going to help the women's team. So um, I think that's what we'll see. Okay. Um, Adrian Delgado, my, my man from Tijuana, says uh, that if you ever played the Mexican team back in the 80s. I think we did. I think we played them uh, maybe at the North Seca Games in Dominican Republic in 1985. Um, I know we had some great, we had some really good teams down there. Um, and the winner of that tournament got to go play in uh, the, um, the World Cup. And there's a great story about that because um, at the time, Dusty Dvorak um, lost his mother. Um, his mother passed away, and so he couldn't be with the team, and this was an extremely important tournament. Um, the setter who took his place was Jeff Stork, and uh, Jeff Stork was going to be arguably – one of the greatest setters that's ever, you know, the United States has ever produced. He's a phenomenal setter. But back then, he was pretty good, but not great. Uh, but the thing about Jeff Stork is he sweated a lot. He uh, perspired a lot. And uh, we played that match against Cuba. And, um, you know, we did really well the first two sets. We beat, I think the scores were 15-4, 15-6. And then Jeff Stork started to fade. He started to turn white. And we lost the third set, 15-12. And then the fourth set, we went out. To, we knew he was getting sick. We went out to an 8-0 run. And Jeff Stork just flopped over on the floor, and that was it. <laughs> so we didn't have a setter. So um, Karch had to go from his outside hitting position to a setting position. And for the end of that match, he said either myself or Steve Timmons. And Craig he never sent the middle. <laughs> wow. And, and uh, Cuba caught up 8-8, and then we beat them 15-13, and we got to go to the World Cup. So that was, that was 
And that was the greatest match I ever played in um, because we did it in such a different way without Dusty and without a setter, and we ended up beating him. So, um, but I think Mexico played in that tournament, and uh, you know they have some great players. I know a lot of them come up here to the United States and play collegiately. So, yeah. Okay. Well, great. Th thanks for sharing, Pat. Uh, the time is gone, so uh, I want to thank you again for being here in the Volley Talks in this episode number 104. And uh, I will ask you, please, if you can share a final words, a final message for all the people who is watching. Uh, you know, I, I think what you're doing is great. I think um, it's great for the volleyball community. And, you know, you get to see different people and, and talk to them and, and converse with them and get good ideas. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, something that can be archived and, and uh, something that, you know, people can look back on and look at these conversations. So... I think, it, I think it's a great idea that you have, and I really appreciate that you put this together and, and uh, you put a lot of time into it, I'm sure. So for that, I thank you, and as do the other 103 people. <laughs> yes, well, it's it's almost 250 hours of, of talking about volleyball. It's great, yeah. great uh, archives. Yeah, that's good okay. to hear. Huh. Well, thanks a lot again, Pat. Please stay, stay safe. Hope to see you pretty soon back in the volleyball court. Alejandro, hey, thank you for having me and goodbye to everybody. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye, Pat. No.